uh, Davide Grasso. Davide is, has PhD in moral theoretical philosophy and philosophical hermeneutics at the University of Turin, where he holds a postdoctoral research fellowship in general sociology. A founding member of the Italian Network for Kurdish Studies, he has conduct, conducted field research in Syria, Turkey, and Iraq. As an active supporter of the Kurdish liberation movement, he has cooperated with the autonomous administration of North and East Syria, analyzing the confederal revolution in its book, Il Fiore del Deserto. His report of the liberation of Manbij by the STV Hevalen is currently under translation in Kurmanji. So uh, please welcome Davide for the last uh, talk of our panel. Thank you. Um, this speak as the Hosim Hemo Hevalan could as a ever conference Lidardikin um, Bipartisan Silabikin on Spasbikim. And uh, also, I would like to express my personal outrage for uh, the University of Hamburg not being able to fulfill its role uh, of protecting freedom of speech and freedom of expression and discussion uh, today. And so this calls us once more to the task of protecting the Kurdish liberation movement in Europe. Um, also because actually I think this movement is one of the few, if not the only one in the world right now that can help us to learn not only about how to analyze and criticize uh, capitalist modernity, but even on how to find a way out of it and how to organize and struggle and even win uh, the fight for ecologic freedom. And even, I will try to, uh, in a few words today, uh, explain even how to maybe win it without becoming monsters, uh, which is not to be taken for granted when it comes to political change, uh, revolutions, or uh, political struggle. I will try to um, list just three examples, uh, in my opinion, important, that we can uh, single out in the work of Abdullah Ojalan and also Mari Bukchin, for that matter, they can help us to figure out how to conduct the struggle for ecologic freedom that might be successful. The first is uh, the challenge to modernity, to capitalist modernity, not to be understood as a fight against modernity itself. In fact, in his uh, uh, work, Beyond the State, Power and Violence, uh, Abdullah Ojalan, uh, tells that the beginning of modernity, uh, the Renaissance here in Europe, was actually a reaction and a rebellion against a certain condemnation of nature and of uh, corporeality that was uh, uh, qualifying uh, previous thought, especially in uh, religious terms in Europe, that was also related to a certain inclination to a domination attitude and so, in fact, the uh, development of modernity is both uh, in Europe and then elsewhere characterized by this uh, uh, re-evaluation of nature on one side, and then to, let's say, a news of the new knowledge that that uh, enabled to dominate nature even more effectively. In fact, Jalan confronts the current opinion, as he calls it, about the existence of an inherent link between capitalism and modernity, and speaks of a friction between capitalism and a certain spirit of the Renaissance, saying that, writing that it would be wrong to all the science and technology responsible for the process of capitalist destruction of nature. They are, he writes, not at fault in this regard because the positivist conception of technique and science do not represent a destiny for modernity, humanity, and science itself. So in this sense, we should, uh, first of all, conceive our struggle as a struggle for a different modernity, a democratic and ecologic modernity. That, of course, entails a sort of change a reversal of social relations, a transformation, 
what Ojolan himself calls a passage in many instances of uh, beyond the state. And in fact, this uh, passage is qualified by Ojolan as a deactivation of a mode of conceiving social relations and the relations between humans and nature. Deactivation is the English translation of uh, the original uh, by Ojolan that has been also translated in German as Zurückdrängen, and interestingly, in the Italian translation, has been translated as a repressione of this mode of conceiving social relations, so sort of repression of a mentality that characterized capitalist conception of modernity. Of course, a deactivation of a mentality is a metaphorical expression. We cannot deactivate capitalism as it was a physical, tangible machine with a bottom. So it is an intangible uh, machine related to mindset and culture in the end. And that is why uh, Mare Bukchin, in, the, in his uh, um, works about the democratic confederalism of the 90s, spoke about the centrality of education in order to accompany a process of transition from uh, uh, oppression to liberation, uh, calling it in Greek paideia. And I would like to uh, conclude uh, this uh, second part of my intervention by trying to see how, in fact, this idea of educating ourselves and others toward an ecologic society entails some contradictions and some challenges, in fact that we should not remove, we should, uh, in fact, face openly. The concept of paideia education, or perverde il comangi, is, uh, in fact, necessarily tied to a sort of hierarchy. There is no education without a hierarchical relation between those who educate and those who are educated. And that is why also a certain idea of authority, and it is my second point, need to be challenged as the current oppressive uh, dominant authority, but at the same time deconstructed in the sense that we also need some sort of power, authority, and organization and force in order to organize and lead the process that would actually, and not just in our iman imagination, bring to a new society. And in fact, in uh, northeastern Syria, uh, it happened to me to attend some genealogy seminars where some friends counterposed, in fact, the Kurmanji word autorite, uh, authority, with destilladari or destilat in the sense of domination. And they were right, at least etymologically, because the word authority, in fact, comes from Latin auctor, uh, which comes as its term from Latin augeo, which means to let it grow, to create. In fact, originally, the autoritas is the respect that is due to those who are able to create something, to sustain something, to let it grow. So it's something different from that what uh, became uh, later. If we uh, aim at creating some transition, then we need to, uh, I think, also to study what uh, Bukchin and Ojalan have said in terms of uh, authority and its characters. For example, in Ecology and Freedom, Barry Mukchin uh, wrote of the evidence of uh, a sort of authority in organic societies that have been free from coercion and command, but not from constraints and in the sense from uh, authority. He wrote, there is in the organic proliterate society of farmers and hunters some leadership. This, however, often turns out to be guidance. So guidance in positive terms, something that is useful because you have some knowledge and you share with others. And I think also this is related to the uh, name that we uh, give to the qualification that we give to uh, President Abdullah Öcalan as a Reber, uh, the person that is able to open the way. And Öcalan himself states, that always in the work beyond the state, that some hierarchical authority was already present in the original communist society of the Neolithic. It was determined by the interest of society, since authorities gained respect and loyalty to the extent to which they returned, distributed, and shared the good produced by everyone. 
This pre-state and communist world only approved hierarchies if they were useful. That is in terms of an effic efficiency tied to generosity. Why am I stressing this um, uh, ostensible paradox of a fight against modernity, against authority, that in fact also needs to deconstruct and reevaluate differently the very concepts of modernity and authority? Because in the end, on one side, we cannot uh, prevent ourselves to uh, try uh, to uh, win this fight for ecologic freedom. On the other, this means that we have to take responsibility to imagine something practical as a possible transition. But at the other side, of course, we do not want uh, to uh, fall in the traps of previous uh, revolutions or previous attempts to change society, as Ojalan would say, of a social engineering of society in positivistic terms. So we want to successfully and that brings us to the last question, that is, uh, so what kind of person, what kind of personality, what kind of people and militants would be able to achieve such a goal? So to open up a transition, a revolutionary transition maybe toward an ecologic society that is not, uh, let's say, a re-instantiation of domination and of statist mentality. We have this trace. Uh, we have a sort of functional power, as Bookchin would say, uh, of guidance, uh, useful hierarchies existed already in the Neolithic, would say, Ojalan. But what I think uh, is really uh, telling, especially in the work of Ojalan, that in this respect is even deeper, profounder, I think, than that of Bookchin, is the idea that the ecologic struggle is not just a struggle in society or against the dominant forces that are dominating and devastating nature, but it's also a fight inside ourselves. It's not just a moral fight in the sense of becoming ecological people in our daily behaviors, that of course is important, but it's something deeper. It has to do with the rebalancing of different forms of intelligence that we have in our personality that corresponds in fact to the rebalancing of the relationship between uh, the humankind in nature. Ujelan distinguishes between emotional intelligence that performs most effectively and mechanically, almost, a protective function through its immediate response to stimuli, and then on the other side, an analytical intelligence that produces a fantasy world of ideas and concepts, discerning, subdividing the real and even the unreal. So this second uh, intelligence, in fact, uh, is related historically also to the capability to organize society and to organize even militarily, to organize even violence, such as in the uh, beginning of civilization with the civilization of the hunters, where the principle of hunt, as Jalan points out in Manifesto 2, is since antiquity to deceive other living beings in order to kill them and trap them. So, in fact, analytic intelligence in Ojalan uh, theory is uh, not responsible, but uh, the imbalance and the domination uh, of analytic intelligence over emotional intelligence has been decisive in order to uh, build a patriarchal and statist culture during history. But it is also interesting that Ojalan on the other side says that the intersection of analytical and emotional dimensions of intelligence is to be considered one of the greatest qualities of the human being. So it is not about destroying analytic intelligence or analysis as much as it is not destroying uh, modernity as such. It is about to, to uh, found some new balance, not only between the humans and nature, but also between each single human and his or her or her own nature. Analytic intelligence, and I'm really concluding, uh, analytic intelligence is in fact important also for our struggle. It is important especially when struggle becomes harder. The impulse to antagonize the established social order may be emotional, but the subversive political choice is deliberate, rational, and somewhat also calculated the very tactics and strategies deployed by activists, revolutionaries, dissidents, require calculation, analysis, and cunning even, 
precisely because the oppressive forces are hunting those who are opposing them, and therefore analytic intelligence not just is important, was important for hunters in preliterate times, but is important for guerrillas or for fighters or for dissidents today. What we need is to build a militant personality, Vigilant thinks, that is able to use analytic intelligence without being enslaved to it. And therefore, the uh, revolutionary confederalist militant and the militant that is able to strive successfully for an ecologic freedom uh, in the future, we hope the near future, need to uh, rely very much also to emotional intelligence. And that is something that uh, may appear a little bit, uh, I don't know, banal or, or to be taken for granted, but actually, I think one of the suggestions that comes uh, stronger from the Kurdish movement for those who had the privilege or have the privilege to interact with the Kurdish militants is that they are able to be analytical at the same time they keep emotional all the way and therefore they are maybe trying and maybe also succeeding to suggest a way of being that is to be political without becoming monsters but at the same time to be actually political. So to challenge uh, effectively the enemy proposing and practicing an actual alternative. Thank you.